It's easy to ascribe your troubles to an unseen force. Toss your problems to the wind. There's nothing you can do to change your luck, so you better just suck it up and write it out. It's even easier to say that it's because of bad luck brought on by something you did, and it can be remedied through mystical means. It's not just a part of life. You did something. You need to rectify it. No need to just write it out until it ends. Here's a convoluted placebo. This week, Marianne and the BSC are having a run of bad luck. Guess which route they take. If they take the former, this will be a very short review. Let's get to it. This is Rereading My Childhood, The Babysitter's Club number 17, Marianne's Bad Luck Mystery. The BSC, well, the BSC minus Mallory, Jesse, and Shannon, are eating lunch. The group includes Logan, who, if you forgot, is Marianne's boyfriend. They don't waste any time, and Marianne dives right into the long descriptions of each member. When she gets to Claudia, we get a great outfit description. It was her vegetable blouse, an oversized white shirt with a green vegetable print all over it. Cabbages and squashes and turnips and stuff. Under the blouse was a very short jean skirt, white stockings, green anklets over the stockings, and lavender sneakers, the kind boys usually wear, with a lot of rubber and big laces, and the name of the manufacturer in huge letters on the sides. Wait, I'm not done. Claudia had pulled her hair on one side of her head with a yellow clip that looked like a poodle. The hair on the other side of her head was hanging in her face. Attached to one ear, you could see was a plastic earring about the size of a jar lid. Oh, please, Netflix, let Claudia continue to wear stuff like this. Although I guess it doesn't matter since they canceled the show. I'll do anything. Although, I don't know what kind of shoes Marianne is talking about. Vans don't say Vans on the side. Nike has the swoosh, but not the letters. Maybe DC? Was that around in the 80s? Anyway, the girls, plus Logan, are talking about the Halloween hop which is the same dance from the second BSC book, Claudia and the Phantom Phone Calls. At another table, BSC adversaries Cokie Mason and Grace Bloom are snickering at the BSC. I'm sure they'll have no influence on the plot whatsoever. Just before the BSC meeting, Marianne gets a letter, but there's no time to open it, so she just takes it with her to the meeting. Turns out it's a chain letter that warns Marianne of bad luck if she breaks the chain. It's weird, I got a chain letter in the mail once, but it promised me postcards from around the world. Never bad luck. I didn't break the chain, but I didn't get any postcards. Any other chain letters I got were emails from the days when I had an AOL screen name and they granted wishes. I still had to go to PE, so it clearly didn't work. The bad luck starts the next morning when Marianne falls out of bed. Then she can't find her shoes. Then she spills juice on herself. Then she can't open her locker. Then she can't find her favorite book, Little Women, in the school library. She comes home to her own copy. I opened the book to the scene where Beth dies. Maybe I would feel cheered up if I read about someone who was having a worse time than I was. That's some serial killer shit, Marianne. If I need cheering up, I turn to the happiest song on earth that isn't saccharin, which is Pentagon Shine. Thank you very much. Anyway, Marianne is deep in that sweet, sweet Beth death when Mrs. Newton calls. Turns out Marianne is late for her babysitting job. She forgot she had a job that day. Oh no, when will the bad luck end? Not on page 30, I'll tell you that much. The bad luck continues and spreads to the rest of the BSC as Don sits for Jackie Radowski, the kid who is referred to as, quote, a happy-go-lucky klutz, and frankly, one of my favorite Stony Brook kids. Don and Jackie are trying to make him a costume, and in the process, Jackie knocks over stuff on every page of the book. Even when he finishes the costume, it collapses. The BSC attributes this not to Jackie's accident-prone nature, but to the chain letter. The next day, Marianne receives a package in the mail. It's addressed to Marianne and the members of the BSC. The group opens it and finds a necklace, a tiny glass ball with a seed inside of it, and a note that says that Marianne has to wear the bad luck charm or else. Or else what? Wear this bad luck charm or else you'll have bad luck? The sender clearly didn't think this through, but neither does the BSC because they're willing to do the note's bidding. The BSC talks about their current string of bad luck, including Claudia getting bad grades, Jesse falling during ballet practice, and Christy losing a watch. Bad luck seeps out of the club and runs rampant through Stony Brook. Jamie Noon falls down and skins his knee, an event so significant it's immortalized on the cover but fails to warrant more than one part of a complex sentence. There is also an explosion in the science lab and a twisted ankle in gym class. While the BSC parses out the occurrences, Koki and Grace are laughing at them, just in case you forgot they existed. I'm sure they have nothing to do with anything. Anyway, the girls go to the library to check out witchcraft books. You might think, Amy, this is ridiculous. This isn't the library from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. 
Au contraire, the section is 133.3 in the Dewey Decimal System and the library was my gateway into the occult and witchcraft. Someday I might go into that one. Until then, it does not surprise me that the girls found the witchcraft section of the library. The thing I don't buy is how strangely convoluted the spells are. Most of the spells I came across were light a white candle during the waning moon and ask for your bad luck to go away. The spells the BSC finds involve difficult to obtain herbs and chanting. The girls each check out a book and run to their meeting. Jesse babysits for the noons and Jamie Noon is not enjoying the idea of Halloween. He's particularly apprehensive regarding trick-or-treaters and he's worried that they might come at any moment, even though it's days before October 31st. Jesse tells him about a series of stories about a friendly little ghost. You all know him, he's quite popular. His name is Georgie? What do you mean there's some other friendly ghost you thought I was talking about? That seems to placate Jamie and he asks to be Georgie the friendly ghost for Halloween. What? Who the fuck is Casper? Claudia and Mallory sit for the Pikes. The kids ruin something called Daddy Stew. Wait, where the hell is Mr. Pike? Oh my god! So they are forced to eat something else for dinner. But before they can decide what to eat, they need to drive a bird out of their home. After Nikki suggests a butterfly net and Margot thinks they should throw a pillowcase over it, Mallory says they should just open the windows. Mallory, I'm sorry I didn't give you enough credit when I was a kid. You're really growing on me. For dinner, instead of eating their father, uh, I mean, um, daddy stew, they eat 18 tuna fish sandwiches. Then Mr. Pike, the new one who is not eaten, and Mrs. Pike arrive home very late. Apparently, there was a massive traffic jam on the freeway and they were unable to call, a problem that is non-existent today with the advent of cell phones, but pointing this out is still hilarious. Chrissy calls an emergency BSC meeting, also known as hanging out in Claudia's room outside the usual time. They try to figure out how to counteract the bad luck, and Jesse finds a spell that includes a white rose, a book of sorcery, and two months. The discussion is interrupted by a storm, but that doesn't stop them from reading a spell that involves oxtail hairs and scrapings from the underside of a sea snake. They eventually dive into evil power masters and a bunch of other authory made-up nonsense that is not in any spell book I've ever seen at the library. They also wonder who could have sent the charm. Gosh, girls, it's definitely not the two girls who have a grudge against Marianne specifically and keep snickering at the BSC. The Halloween hop is finally here and Marianne dresses up as a cat from the horror musical Cats. Specifically, she dresses in a leotard, a pair of slippers, and she paints black and gray stripes across her face. She's either Grizabella or Minku Strap. Logan is also decked out, albeit without the leotard, and instead of black and gray stripes, he's in tiger stripes. He's Rum Tum Tugger, it seems. So Minku Strap and Rum Tum Tugger make their way to the Jellicle Ball to perform for an old cat who decides who gets to die. Or the Halloween hop. Neither name is great. Logan and Marianne see some of their friends, including Don, who is dressed as a witch. There's your spellcaster. They also come across Koki, who comments on Marianne's bad luck charm. When Marianne gets home, there's another letter for her. It beckons the BSC to go to Old Man Hickory's headstone at midnight on Halloween. Too spooky! The BSC have yet another emergency meeting. Jesse asks about Old Hickory. Apparently, he's an old man who died of meanness. If only that could happen. Then people would stop being so terrible to retail workers, the true de-escalating heroes of our time. They realize that it's a trap, and we're at page 100, and they have to wrap this up. The plan for the night starts with Charlie driving them to the cemetery earlier than midnight as indicated in the letter. Before the shenanigans can begin, Christy has to take David, Michael, Karen, and Andrew trick-or-treating. In a relic from the past, Christy has to make sure that Andrew doesn't want to wear his mask. I remember extensive PSAs warning parents not to let their kids wear masks because they obscure their vision. The 80s were a different time. While that's going on, Marianne shows her father the bad luck charm. He says that it's not a bad luck charm, but some religious thing. It's a mustard seed that somehow symbolizes faith. Look, this is all beyond me. I was raised secular. The most exposure I had to religion was if I spent the night at a friend's house and the next morning I was forced to wake up and listen to some guy talk for a few hours in a stuffy room. I didn't learn anything about the Bible or Jesus. What I learned is that I shouldn't sleep over at that friend's house on a Saturday. So the BSC brings various items to the cemetery. A few flashlights, masks, string sheets. Sounds like they're going to a clan rally, or as I like to call it, the policeman's ball. Hi-yo! 
They string the sheets up, and when Koki Mason and her friends arrive, they make the sheets look like ghosts. This freaks out Koki and the others just in time for Logan to show up and see them. Grace expounds on their brilliant plan. Oh, we might as well tell them. She said them as if she were referring to a swarm of flies. We just wanted to make you, all of you, but especially Marianne, look like, well, like jerks. We kind of wanted Logan to get fed up with you. Grace's voice was fading away. It was hard to tell in the darkness, but I think she was blushing. Cool plan? As if Logan would be all, Oh man, Marianne, I really liked you until I saw you get spooked. I can't be with a girl who has human feelings. I don't think very highly of Logan, especially since his You're not like other girls comment, but I don't think he'd do that. Koki and her friends leave with their tails between their legs and the BSE continues their Halloween sleepover. In the end, they realize that their string of bad luck was really a coincidence. Also, while we learn who sent the necklace and the threats, we never found out who sent Marianne the chain letter at the beginning. How's that for a final scare? Take that, R.L. Stein. I remember being obsessed with luck when I was a kid. Truthfully, I'm still superstitious. Compound that with my tendency toward obsessive compulsive behaviors, and it can be quite debilitating. However, that discussion is for another day, and not at the end of a book in which the main character dresses up as a cat and wears a seat around her neck. The lesson is don't listen to random letters in the mail, and the ones teasing you from another lunch table are probably the ones instigating the events of the plot. And just because you get sent jewelry in the mail doesn't mean you have to wear it. This is advice for everyone. <laughs>